We know what blockchain is, i.e. a distributed ledger technology that enables us to move value in a decentralized manner and in a secure manner. It's immutable, it's traceable, it's transparent. Bearing those three things in mind, I'd like to suggest to you, let's start with a case. I'm going to suggest two case studies. Number one, you're sitting in your law firm and I have assumed that there are three kinds of lawyers here. There's government, there's private sector, and two kinds of lawyers in private sector. You're advising a client who needs a service, you're advising a client who needs a solution. I'm going to distinguish the two. So I'm going to give you a case for each one of those three lawyers. You're sitting in your office at the Capital Max Authority of Kenya, and your boss, who's the director legal and corporate services comes to you and says, we have heard that Binusu or OKX or Binance or Huobi, one of the biggest crypto exchanges in the world, wants to open an office in Kenya. They've asked for a license. We know that CBK is also looking into whether or not they should regulate. So please give us an opinion very carefully. By the way, you should note that this exchange has a habit of moving its offices from one country to another, depending on where regulation is lighter than the other. So they are saying now they want to bring head offices here, but they might want to take them to Uganda because regulation there is better. How many of us know what questions you would be asking in that context? Because you have to write an opinion. And I hope that the Kenyans will be faster because in East Africa, you're the only people who have a decision involving a regulator and crypto. That's why as a lawyer you should care. What questions would you ask to give proper advice? What questions would you ask? To be able to know that from a regulator's perspective, you are taking into account everything you need to know. But that poses another problem. Number one, when you talk about blockchain, everyone just almost automatically by default goes to cryptocurrency and crypto assets and that ecosystem. But that's just only a very small part of, of the process. So let's go to process number two. Yesterday afternoon, while, I, while we were in the last session here, I got a phone call from someone in the Netherlands who said, oh, I've heard about what you're doing at the Center for Law and Emerging Tech. Yes, that's a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> can we have a chat? So I stepped out and I said, oh, there's this good product coming up in Uganda. We're struggling with all this information around customs and taxation. And, you know, every time we have to move goods out of Uganda, we must fill out certain forms. And if someone makes a mistake in one letter in the form, we have to start again. And some forms take 23 days to get. And there must be a simpler way. I said, so you mean you want to develop a blockchain solution for international trade in Uganda? And he said, yes, how did you know? I said, I'm a genius. Of course, he couldn't tell the difference. Um, but that's another reason. Two years ago, the WTO did a report. In that report, they documented the study where they had traced a container of flowers from Mombasa to Europe, to the Netherlands. That container took 34 days to go from the port of Mombasa to the Netherlands. There were 100 people involved. The documents were 25 centimeters thick. At some point, one document got lost, and it took 10 days to find it. That entire process is going to collapse the moment blockchain goes into customs, which I can tell you from good authority is already underway. I know that right now, if you go to the URA offices, and I believe the TRA offices as well, and the, and the KRA offices, you will be able to see every truck on East Africa's roads, every single truck, in real time. We figured out how to trace the movement of goods on the roads, 
And the only thing missing is centralizing how the documents for those movements happen. And you know how we know that's going to happen? Because we've already done the single window. So I bring my car from Dubai or Germany or the UK. I come with my number plates from Uganda. I go to Mombasa. I slap them on there and I drive across the border. When I get to the difference between a personalized a car that I'm buying for myself and goods that my client is moving is that when the goods go from Mombasa, where I actually paid the tax, to Busia or Malaba, where I must get through to continue to my destination, I lose time. I lose seven to ten days with goods sitting on trucks there. Why? Because someone must verify that these documents are legitimate. Well, what blockchain is going to do is to make sure that the moment a document is uploaded at Mombasa, or from wherever it's being uploaded, whether it's the payment systems, because the typical national trade transaction has four parts. You have the commercial transaction, you have the transportation, you have the financing, and then you have the receipt and storage. Now, if the commercial transaction goes on blockchain, the financing is on blockchain, the moment a bill of lading is issued, everyone can see it, whether you are KRA or Uganda Revenue Authority or the shipper or whoever. Now think about your client who has a tax dispute. And they are arguing with KRA whether or not this document is legitimate. Suddenly, that argument is pointless. But for us as lawyers, it raises another issue. What is the legal status of blockchain backed transactions? Because in Uganda, where I come from, what we did when we were writing the Electronic Transactions Act was that we prescribed definitions in the statute that are very specific to technology. A good law should be agnostic to technology and not specific. So technically speaking, our law is the direct opposite of what blockchain tries to do. Because it imagines a centralized system of storing public infrastructure keys. And yet blockchain, in its truest form, i.e. Bitcoin, and that kind of transactions that you do on Bitcoin, decentralizes the storage of keys. So as lawyers, whether you're a regulator or a consultant in private practice, or you're advising a client, we need to get on board with understanding the technical issues behind blockchain and how those technical issues infuse with, with the law as it stands today. And therefore, what legal framework do we need for the future? The, Easiest example I can use in terms of advising governments on how to go about these problems and the mistakes we are making comes from the cryptocurrency or crypto assets ecosystem. Typically, because most of us don't get into the technical issues, we just assume that the only thing that exists in the crypto assets ecosystem is a cryptocurrency and the vending of currencies. That's a very, very, very bad assumption because there are, there's a whole ecosystem with different players issuers, secondary market, peripheral services, you know, I, and, and those are very different. Wallets, you can't regulate a wallet the same way you would regulate an exchange because one is a service provider to the other. You know, how has the economy, how has the ecosystem evolved? We came from ICOs which caused all the noise that we saw in the world a few years ago to STOs. But the one time I had a chance to write a regulator about regulating a cryptocurrency exchange, we started at the beginning and said, let's define. Just this morning, I read that one of our students at the Center for an Emerging Tech had tweeted an article that came out yesterday in France. And a, a, a local court in France has classified Bitcoin as a currency. What does that mean? Definitions and classifications. You know how when you pick up a statute, you never really go to the definition section until you have to? Well, in this case, that's one of the biggest problems we must decide. Are cryptocurrencies assets or are they securities? When I had to write an application, I chose the path to say, we have taken the view that crypto assets are not securities, but we think you should regulate. Why? Because you're being transparent and you have nothing to hide. The regular wrote back to me and said, you're right, these are not securities. We'll call you a need fright law, but for now, we're fine. Now, the result is that you then allow another problem to emerge, which is the problem of hardy. Scam, scammers come and see, oh, this thing is hip and sexy. So they start to scam people in the name of 
cryptocurrency. This has happened in Uganda over the last five months or so. Oh, there is this thing, and now when there's a public up, uh, uproar, and by the way, even intelligent people get sucked in. Now you have clients who are saying, and this is the part where you go to the third lawyer in the room, you're in private practice, a guy says, look, I have lost one million Kenya shillings to someone who said they sold me crypto and it was bogus. It was just really a pyramid scheme. Uh, how do I get it back? Where do you start? Or let's use a more legitimate situation. A client comes to you and says, I have three million Kenya shillings I want to invest in crypto. Should I invest or not? Do you know what questions you would ask for due diligence purposes? Do you know where you would look? This is why we must care about blockchain. But I don't like to focus too much on crypto because it narrows the conversation. If you can think about a single place where documents are stored or value is stored, that inter where, your clients, where you interface with the client, that's a potential blockchain use case. A land registry, a company's registry, SIM card registration, I'm mentioning examples of proof of, con of concepts I've seen in Uganda that are being built. A blockchain is being built for SIM card registration. What is that going to do? It's going to solve interoperability between the telecoms such that you can now send money across platforms without difficulty. Safaricom, I believe, has solved that here. But in Uganda, we're doing it with the regulator. It's also going to take away the idea that you can, a common problem in Kenya. I borrow money using a SIM card, I refuse to pay, I throw away the SIM card, I buy a new SIM card, I borrow money using that SIM card, I refuse to pay, I throw it away. Now that's not going to be possible in Uganda because every SIM card that's bought in real time will be available to every telecom provider and the regulator. So what the digital lenders are going to do essentially is plug into that process to say, the same way that you would go and trace and track in banking to say, I'm going to look at... Uh, what, what are these guys called? The, the ones who do credit checks. It's the same way you should be able to do the credit checks in real time. Now, what that does is that it brings so many people into one room. But if your client wants access to that blockchain to be able to verify and say, I want to know that every time someone requests a loan, I can check in real time and know if these people have defaulted on a loan or not. How do you get access? What do you negotiate for? If you're a privacy expert saying, but wait, someone is going to have all this data at their disposal, are they government or private sector? Because you're talking about, in Uganda's case, over 20 million telecom subscribers. That data is power. The advantage with putting it on the blockchain is we are saying no one is going to be able to manipulate it but at their will. It also means that potentially we now have a window to see what are the telecoms doing with all this data they have? But if you're sitting in that room advising the telecoms, the regulator, users, digital lenders, what risks are you looking at? And by the way, I'm not making this up. This is an ongoing project in Uganda right now. My point is that as lawyers, we can sit back and say that stuff is too complex. I have had lawyers make that argument. But when we start to fight about whether there was a breach of statutory provisions when UCC procured a private company to do this project, you will need to know what to argue. The central bank in Uganda last month awarded a contract to a company to do KYC in banking. KYC, strangely, is the biggest problem in banking. In Uganda, the compliance rate is at 26% of all the banks, big or small. No bank has a rate of KYC compliance that exceeds 26%. From the biggest, which I believe to be Standard Bank and DFCU, to the smallest, which I believe to be you know, banks that you've never heard about. KYC on blockchain potentially can solve that problem. But if a regulator does a deal with one guy, Where does that put everyone else? Do they have the capacity? Because I can tell you, because I sit on the board of a bank, that what happens usually is when you have one player service in the entire market, they never have the bandwidth. This is the same thing with audit cycles. We must file our audited accounts every 30th of March. And in the month of March, all the big four accounting firms in Uganda cannot give you time because the big four are auditing 25 banks. Now, here you have one client, one company, 
building a blockchain solution for the entire industry. What risks do you see? What solutions would you propose? Because I tell you this, one of those people, there's someone, a blockchain is going to affect your client at some point in the next two years. For lawyers, it's a really good thing because then we can start to build a truth machine. The assumption is going to be that once data is on the blockchain, it's legitimate. So if I have to go and argue with Kenya Revenue Authority about whether or not these goods were cleared, all I have to do is rely on data that they've put on the blockchain. But do I have access to that data? Should, public, should blockchains in public institutions be private blockchains or should they be open to everyone to view and to search for as long as you know what you're looking for? I don't have the answers. My job is to ask you the questions. And I'm saying all of this to say that as lawyers, we must, absolutely must get involved. The mistake we've seen from the last two decades of tech in Africa is that we let the geeks define the space and then we come and try to regulate which pushes us back to them to try and understand what, to say to them, okay, you write it in your language and then I will put in English. I kid you not, that's how we ended up with legislation that defines technical aspects of technology in Uganda. The world is now going to principle-based regulation. Just yesterday in the afternoon session on AI, uh, Friedrike was, was talking about the report from the Bachmann Klein Center. Principled AI. I've read that report and the first thing that struck me in the introduction was it said there was no data from Africa. I thought this is just wrong. Whether you measure the world by how many continents there are, you take out Africa and it's no longer a complete world. Whether you measure us by population, I mean you take out Nigeria and South Africa, you no longer have a complete universe. It cannot be that people are talking about principles for AI and our voices don't matter. The truth of the matter is that we can say our voices matter, but until we start to participate in the conversation, why should they care? Now, I, I happen to believe that lawyers should write the rules for these things. A, out of self-preservation, because, I mean, look, you really want to kick us out of the room? By the way, when people say, oh, the hey, robots are coming, they're going to displace everyone, I am quick to point out the only profession that will be here when the robots are gone is the law. Why? Because it's the only profession that will be practiced in heaven. God himself retired from engineering and became a lawyer. The first trial was in the Garden of Eden. There was evidence, there was an argument, there was a sentence. And if you believe in the Bible or in any form of religion, you know, there will be a judgment at the end of this, this transaction called life. You know, so whichever you look at it, we are the only guys who will be here after the movie credits have, <laughs> are done running. When the lights come back on in the cinema, we will still be here. However, on a more serious note, I could give you use case upon use case. International trade, banking and finance, letters of credit, all of this stuff is going to go on the blockchain. Now, you think about the disputes we've been having about, oh, no, uh, because how long would it take you to argue uh, uh, in an international trade case? The bill of lading was forged. By the time we make that argument in court in Uganda, you have filed pleadings. Exchanging pleadings in Uganda, if everyone is keeping time, takes 40 days. Because I file, I serve you, you have 15 days to file a defense, I have 15 days to reply. Between the time I file and serve it is five days. 15, 15, 30. Easily 40 days if you throw in weekends. That's two months. And then we have two months of mandatory mediation. Right? And then we have three months of adjournments. And then we have basically, long short, a trial takes at least in the High Court of Uganda, minimum three years. Now, we are talking about smart contracts where essentially we are going to say, look, this is the contract, right? I'm going to pay you for every step of the way. When you hand the goods off to a carrier, tokens will move to you. When the carrier issues a bill of lading and we all sit on the blockchain, tokens will move. Money will come to you. When the goods reach Mombasa, money will come to you. When, so if you don't perform, you don't get paid. Why should we go and fight about that in a court of law? 
you didn't perform. I didn't see the bill of lading. It was not on the blockchain. I am, are we seeing the same blockchain? It's the same blockchain. Why? I haven't paid you because, I mean, here is the thing. A geek will code the smart contract. A lawyer will negotiate it. But do you know how to audit and make sure what was negotiated is what is in the smart contract? This is where we will now need to negotiate between law firms and startups and tech companies to say, how do we build synergies? How do we build bridges across professions? I don't think that I can finish the conversation on blockchain in 20 minutes, but I hope that I have said one thing that piques your interest on saying, as a lawyer, I need to understand. And by the way, the other mistake we make is this. You read three pages of an article and you assume you've figured it all out. Please don't do that. My recommendation to you is start at an ecosystem, and there are different ecosystems. If you pick a field like blockchain and banking, what's the ecosystem there? What does it look like? If you pick blockchain and international trade, what's the ecosystem there? What should it look like? If you pick blockchain and insurance, settlement of claims. If you pick blockchain and health data. By the way, it's not just the payment systems themselves. It's also about data. One of the commonest things you will find in most countries in Africa is that when I go to a hospital, I get treated. They have my information. When I want that information, they say, oh, no, 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 we'll just give you a summary report. It happened to me. I wrote to the hospital and said, for the life of me, you have four days. Give me these documents. Oh, I promise you, I will burn you to the ground. The thing about having a law firm letterhead is that people take you very seriously. Four days later, they called my wife and said, come for your stupid documents. Take them, never come back here. Can these documents be put on systems where I should have access to them? Because blockchain essentially should decentralize access to information such that I can get any information I want in real time. But then we must have serious questions about privacy. What kind of information and identifiers are you putting on this? How are you labeling this information for public consumption? You know, our governments are sharing health data. At least in Uganda, I know for a fact that there's an MOU between the US Embassy and the Ministry of Health to share health data. It cannot be that the Americans can get health data in Uganda, but I can't. That, that's just repugnant. Now, if you think about it, a solution for that is make it available for everyone to see. Do you want to go down that route? Privacy lawyers in this place would really have a field they have in this conversation. But at the same time, is privacy achievable as a human right in the digital age? My honest, unpopular view, to which I bind only myself, is that privacy ceased being a human right at the turn of the century. Privacy is now a commodity. Because it's impossible, even if you tell Google to delete all your data, some other search engine has it anyway. And Google, given its nature, just cannot forget you. It, it's technically impossible. It's technically impossible to be able to achieve some of these norms and aspirations as lawyers we hold so dear. And so I believe that whether you're talking about a blockchain-enabled world or a 4 ir enabled world, we need a new legal framework. And that framework should not be left to geeks. It should be written by lawyers. But also I believe that new problems and society's challenges have evolved to a point where, as lawyers, to be able to provide meaningful advice, we must understand the technical issues behind these challenges. What I have tried to do in this brief uh, presentation is to highlight to you some, not all, and, and in a very superficial manner I, 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 I concede that, I've tried to just tease your mind towards paying attention to what do we need to be thinking about. If you're moving, you know, drugs on drones, and, and commendable what Rwanda is doing, I think highly commendable, blazing the trail on the continent, can you track the data of, and how do you secure that data? Blockchain is the perfect solution there. How do you know that drugs went from place A to place B? Traceability of medicines. Do you have those issues where drugs reach the port but never reach the hospital? In Uganda, it's a big problem. Drugs enter Mombasa, enter Busia, reach national medical stores, but from there to the hospital, no one knows what happened to them. We even had a documentary done by BBC and some Ugandan journalists won award about this. We discovered that there were big people involved in the siphoning of drugs. 
what you need to do is just label and put all those labels on the blockchain and then you will really, really solve a major part of the corruption issues we have on this continent. Whether you're talking about land registries, uh, medical data, tracing goods, moving goods and services, solving evidentiary issues, data audits would get incredibly simpler if you're on the blockchain. All of these spaces are being disrupted by someone. I have not mentioned one example here for which I don't know anyone doing it in the space. And I have been in the room where you're thinking to yourself, when we were studying this stuff, I used to think as a lawyer, man, how do you meaningfully contribute to this conversation? Because when geeks are in the room, they automatically assume you have a degree in coding. So you have to sort of quickly catch up on the buzzwords. Otherwise, you won't define the risk properly. And if you can't define the risk properly as a lawyer, I doubt that you will have the correct, most practical advice for your client. Whether your client is a regulator or a player in the private sector or a person who has been scammed, someday in the next two, three years, you will interact with someone who has done work on the blockchain. And I hope that by then you will have found the answers that you need. We're out of time and I hope that this was useful to you.